chapter 16. And we want to begin reading with verse 13 down through verse 19, get a little bit of context here. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So our thought this evening, we want to take from verse 18, where he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And our subject is perpetuity and succession. Perpetuity and succession of the church that Jesus built, which is what he is intimating here when he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word perpetuity and the, these terms, perpetuity and succession are terms that we use uh, in reference to the Lord's New Testament church. Of course, these words have meanings and they're used uh, in other ways, uh, but we use them to describe a, a certain characteristic of the church that Jesus has built here. And uh, that word perpetuity, just looking it up in the dictionary, you know, existing forever or continuously, never ceasing. And this is what Jesus has promised uh, in reference to his church when he said, and uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but also in, in Matthew uh, chapter 28 in the commission, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of of the world or the end of this age. Um, we see this also, the concept referenced when uh, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth concerning the Lord's Supper uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me um, get busy here. And, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, and, and reference to the church observing uh, the Lord's Supper. He said, For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. So the, the reference there is there will be churches in this world, the churches of the, the type that Jesus built, observing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper as it was delivered to the churches as uh, Paul was doing here or correcting and reminding them of how it was delivered till the Lord comes back. And the Lord hasn't come back yet, but there are still churches here fulfilling uh, that promise. We see also in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 20, 21, um, He says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And so here again we see um, throughout all ages, the word uh, there means a space of time. A uh, world without end refers to an age or time, duration, continuance of time, an age or dispensation. So in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, Paul talks about this dispensation of grace that's given 
to the Gentiles. So throughout this dispensation, the end of this age, God will be receiving the glory by His Son, Jesus Christ, through His churches, which Jesus established uh, through all this time, throughout all ages. So in other words, the church that Jesus built would have a continuous presence in this world, functioning as established till He comes. And that's important for us to understand that aspect of it. Jesus wasn't talking about, well, there would be some kind of organization or institution in this world that's calling itself a church till I come back. But the church that He Himself is building and as we see the instructions in the, the scriptures, you know, uh, in the commission, you know, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That kind of church is going to be here. Uh, when he says, keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you, unto you. There will be churches observing those ordinances in that manner in which uh, the Apostle Paul describes there in 1 Corinthians. Um, Observing, not perverting it into something else, not making of it a sacrament that uh, through which we receive saving grace to help save us and, and all these other things that people have come up with. It's not just an uh, uh, ordinance of Christian fellowship and, and things like that. It's a church ordinance given to the church to observe and to administer. Uh, and, and so churches will be doing it till he comes back. Uh, he had admonished his churches to earnestly contend for the faith, there to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Uh, that faith that was once delivered to the saints. There'll be churches here uh, upholding the truths of God's Word, following the truths of God's Word, contending for and defending the, that faith that was once delivered, till he comes. That's the idea of uh, the, the perpetuity uh, that we're, we're talking about here. And uh, till he comes back, Jesus had, had promised he's going to come back. And, and there's a particular aspect of that promise uh, to his church. Because as we touched upon this morning, the, the church, it, the relationship of his church then to him is that of a, a spouse or a promised wife. And just as the, the Jewish uh, traditions and all that was a part of the culture when Jesus established his church, uh, there is a period when the, that espousal is, is made that the bridegroom returns home to the father and prepares a place where he and his bride will live. And that's what he said there in John, the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. I, I go and I prepare a place for you. I think that is not just a reference to uh, him going to the cross and dying for our sins. It's not that God's in the process of building a, uh, a place. Because he said, in my Father's house are already there are places of many abodes. That, that was already there. But to prepare, as it were, as a groom prepares the place for his bride, the home for his bride. And then he returns back for his bride to take her with him, along with the friends of the bride and, and all the other attendants that, that will be there. And so this is a part of that concept and that promise. And, and so and this is described to in Thessalonians when Paul's writing there, you know, he said, I, I wouldn't have you be ignorant of this, brethren, you know, talking about those that had already died that were believers, that they wasn't going to be left behind, that the, the living saints weren't going to somehow get a, a head start on, on those that had died when it comes to the resurrection, when the Lord comes back. But he explains how when he comes in the air and the dead in Christ are going to be raised first, and then we that are alive and remain will be changed. And then together we're going to go up to meet the Lord in the air. And so this is the promise of His return. Well, this has not occurred yet, obviously. But the promise was that His churches would remain and remain functioning 
as He established it. That's the idea of perpetuity. Uh, functioning as established. Carrying out the commission that we see that was given to it. Uh, which includes not just evangelizing, but administering scriptural baptism. You know, sprinkling of an infant is not baptism. His promise of perpetuity is not to a group that practices that. The institution has delivered, uh, an, or the ordinance of baptism has delivered to his church was the immersion in water of a believer. And so that, kind of, that limits, uh, and as we pointed out this morning, at, at, there was a time in history, now everybody immersed, but there was a distinction between what has come to be known as believer's baptism, or we refer to it as scriptural baptism, uh, because uh, we acknowledge there's a proper authority required as well. Um, or we might say Baptist baptism because uh, that was the only two was the Catholic and the Baptist churches was all that existed at that time and so the distinction uh, would have been a believer's baptism or Baptist baptism that's part of the commission that he gave to him and he said and, you know you do these things lo I'm with you always even to the end of this age so I'm going to be there with you present in the church administering, admonishing, and so on through His churches to give glory to His Father uh, throughout all ages. Uh, that's part of it. And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. There's where the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth and earnestly contending uh, for that faith that was once delivered. Uh, as we said, keeping the ordinances, baptism, the Lord's Supper, being the pillar and the ground of the truth, earnestly contending for the faith, and habitation of God through the Spirit. Uh, for should an individual church cease to function as established, as we taught on this morning, they leave their first love and they lose their candlestick, uh, Jesus, Jesus removes that candlestick. That individual church would cease to be a church of Christ and would become instead a synagogue or congregation of Satan, yet no matter how widespread the corruption may become, God will always reserve and preserve to Himself a remnant that will not fall away. That is part of the promise. Romans 11, and we'll, we'll turn there. Some of these hopefully are familiar enough uh, just in referencing them. <coughs> Uh, you, you remember and understand where it's found. But in Romans 11, uh, verses 1 through 5, he says, Satan hath God. Now he uses Israel as an example of this principle. But he's saying this to a Gentile church. He's writing this to the church which is in Rome, of the whole place. And I say then, hath God cast away his people? Talking about the Jewish people, the Israelite people. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not, or know ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, or Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed uh, thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And he goes on to say uh, it's by grace and, and not of works. But we see, and not only was there a remnant of the Jews uh, that were saved at that time, Paul himself being an example of that, but I do believe also that, that, that God has always uh, maintained to Himself a people that will be faithful. This is the grace of God. Uh, he has established His church. 
He has established his church to be his witness to act in his name in this earth till he comes back. He has not come back yet. His church is still here. And so, fulfilling that promise that he made when he said the gates of hell shall not uh, prevail against it. So perpetuity is the term that we use in describing that aspect, that characteristic of the Lord's church, that it will be perpetually here. It will not cease. There will not be an interruption. There will not be a broken line, if you will. Uh, but His churches will continue in this world till He comes back. Now, the word succession uh, has something of an overlapping idea and is it goes with the perpetuity. Uh, succession coming one after another, a series one after another in order. That's the idea of a succession, whether uh, you talk about the uh, succession of authority in England, the kings, they have certain rules and things. The line of succession, who will follow? To whom will that crown be passed down? They have rules as to who that is, you see. We have a line of succession if somebody, something happens to the president, then the vice president takes over. Something happened to the president and the vice president, the, um, oh, the, the, the house, speaker of the house, that's it. The speaker of the house is the next in line of succession. Okay, so we have established certain, this, this idea of a line of succession that will follow. And of course now in England it's hereditary through the family and things here. It's by election and so on and so forth. But we, we have, but this is the idea of succession. When applied to the church, it kind of shows how does the church perpetuate itself? How is it that the church is perpetuated? That is the succession part of this. The commission in, in um, well, as applied to the church when Jesus built, it refers to the way in which churches perpetuate themselves by creating new churches as uh, in an orderly fashion. And, and so there is an orderly process that is established in the church uh, in the very commission that is given to it, how to, to do this and create new churches. And uh, as he said in 1 Corinthians, he said, let all things be done decently and in order. So there is an order by which this is done that is laid out for us in the scriptures. Uh, and, and part of this we see over in Titus, in, uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Titus was one of the young preachers that had followed Paul around, like Timothy. And, uh, and when Paul would move on, he would leave one of them behind to uh, set things in order. This is what he says to Titus. We read in, in, in Acts, the first missionary journey of Paul, and, and he preached the gospel in these cities and baptizing the disciples. And then he went back through confirming the souls, ordaining elders in the churches, because, okay, obviously now there were churches there, and commending them into the hands on whom they believed. And we see here in, um, in Titus, uh, he says, Paul, a servant of God, and this is in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, 
that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And so Titus was left with the task, he said, of setting things in order. Paul, they had preached the gospel, they had baptized disciples, but now these uh, locations, again, the church is a local body. Each town, village, whatever, where they preached, they would organize a church there to be in that location, to minister to those people, and so on. And so Titus was given to set in order. So the idea of the succession here, there's an orderly process to this succession in the Lord's churches. It's not just some osmosis uh, that takes place, but there is an order which is to be followed. And, and it involved, you know, establishing, teaching them to observe all things, delivering unto them the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, delivering unto them that, that doctrine of, of Christ, that faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's being passed on. And to ordain them elders uh, in each of these, these churches then. And so we see this, uh, the commission, the blueprint or pattern for churches to perpetuate themselves by going and evangelizing, preaching the gospel, baptizing them, uh, you see, and then teaching them to observe all things. Uh, so this commission is the blueprint. First, and there's two ways that following this commission perpetuates the church. First of all, by adding to themselves. So you have a church, or you have the church at Jerusalem. And on the day that they was preaching the gospel to the multitudes that was there, the Lord saved uh, thousands. And they were baptized, and then they were added to the church at Jerusalem. And so... This, uh, in this way, that was one of the, the ways we do it. The, a single local church perpetuates itself for many generations. You know, this church here, of course, y'all, your parents were charter members here. And, but you've seen a lot of people added to the church over the years. The church is still here. Not the same membership, but... For generations, this church has been here. It's added to itself, and, and people have left and died off. And add. So that's one way a particular local church perpetuates itself over many generations. Um, and the second way, uh, a church perpetuates the institution by establishing more churches in other places, which in turn will perpetuate themselves in that location. And again, and in other locations. So we see this process uh, and, and uh, the way that this occurs, thus ensuring the survival of the institution throughout all ages, even if many fall to the wiles of the devil, to, to persecution and, and the corruption and things. And individual churches fall through this process uh, the succession of churches uh, by generation in one location or by establishing other churches, some survive and perpetuate. You know, God perpetuated the human race when he destroyed the earth in saving eight souls on the ark. The rest of the world's population perished in that flood. But the human race was perpetuated and restarted through that. And so we may see through natural disaster, plague, persecution, corruption, individual local churches ceasing and passing out of existence. But because they had multiplied and spread, others lived on to perpetuate the Lord's institution as established. Through corruption, many have fallen into error and, and as we point out, have become the, the congregation of, of Satan and so on. 
those are they are not perpetuating the Lord's church. That's not part of the perpetuation of the Lord's church as he promised. But that Satan perpetuating his, you know, promoting and perpetuating the, the mystery of iniquity, if you will. Uh, but an example of both, I, I believe we see, it, one example that comes to my mind, a personal uh, attachment, the church at Bryan Station, which was established in 1786. Now, none of that original church are still alive today. But that church has existed in that location through all these generations to this present day. And even according to the little plaque, preaching the same gospel they preached before Kentucky was a state. They are still following the original pattern upon which they were established, which goes all the way back to the church at Jerusalem. But they've also perpetuated themselves by organizing new churches in other locations as well. And so we see this pattern. We can identify how it is working today, but this was the pattern that was established uh, in, in the, uh, the New Testament. And so this is the promise of perpetuity and succession of the church uh, that Jesus built. Um, and, and one of the things we see there even in the church at Jerusalem, and, and we talk about uh, it perpetuating and starting other churches, and there's a couple of ways that is done, and we see that in, in the scripture as well. The, chur the church at Antioch, was a result not necessarily of a missionary going out, but there were so many saved that had come to Jerusalem uh, from different areas. And they were part of that 4,000. Later, another 3,000 were saved. Uh, and this was going on and going on in Jerusalem to the church there had just become. Well, these mega churches today don't have a thing on what that church at, at Jerusalem, that original church, was like. And you imagine, you know, over 7,000 members? Because you had 4,000 added on one day, so you had 120 plus 4,000. Then later there was another occasion where there was 3,000 added. So you have, well, and then they continue, and, and uh, the elders, the Jewish elders and all complained, said, we command, didn't we strictly command you not to preach or teach anymore in the, the name of Jesus Christ? And, and look what you've done. you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. You've just filled it. <laughs> and so when the persecution came against the church there in Jerusalem, uh, some of these people decided, you know, I think it's time. I've been getting a little homesick for Bithynia, you know, or for this place, Cappadocia, wherever. And so they began to leave and go back to where they had come from originally. But they had been there long enough that they had been indoctrinated. They, you know, they had been saved. The Lord saved them. They had been baptized. They had been added to the church. They had been taught and, and had seen it practiced and, and everything. It's kind of like an incubator there. And now all of a sudden, all these little chicks have hatched and they're just going out. And, and so we see where some of them came to Antioch there in Assyria. And not to be confused with the Antioch in Bithynia. But the, they was preaching the gospel and, and get Gentile believers. And some of these were proselytes. Some of these had been Gentiles that had come down to Jerusalem for the Passover. They were proselytes to the Jewish religion and had been saved. And so Jews and proselytes returning back and they began to preach to the Gentiles, to the Greeks there. And the Lord started saving them. And so it's like, uh, what do we do? And he sent back to the church at Jerusalem, and, and Jerusalem sends Barnabas up there, and they organized the church there in Antioch. And so in this way, where a group maybe splits off, where the, the one church has become so big, it dot divides. And one group becomes a new church. And that's how the church at Antioch came into existence. We see that sometimes happening. Um, 
Well, and again, the church at Bryan Station did that at one time. Uh, they had so many members, and this was back in the 1700s. Uh, they traveled by buggy and everything, but there was a group of them that lived a ways off, and they they got permission, and, and so they separated. And this was not a split. There was not an argument or anything like that. They just uh, separated, and they was organized into a separate church. It was Davis Fork. That's how that church came into existence. Uh, church in... Um, Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, kind of came into existence when uh, one of the men there at Bryan Station, he was my first Sunday school teacher. Uh, he'd been a postman, postal deliverer. Uh, and he had quit that job and, and was preaching full time. And he was my first Sunday school teacher. Well, shortly after that, he went to Georgetown and started to work there. They had 40 members of the Bryan Station Church that went there with him and help establish that church. But then we see, uh, like the Apostle Paul then, the church at Antioch, here's a new church that's been organized. It's a Gentile church. And so the Holy Spirit leads them to send out Paul and Barnabas as missionaries. And they go further, much further afield, and begin to preach the gospel, baptize, make, and baptize disciples, and then organize them into churches and in ordaining elders to, to watch over those churches in these various places. And so we see examples of this perpetuity and succession uh, in the New Testament. This is how it's done. And we can see churches today. We're still doing that. You know, whether it's a, a missionary in Kenya or a, a missionary in the Philippines or something like that, we are... Uh, uh, Supporting and, and churches are sending out missionaries to these different places to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to baptize them, and, and hopefully eventually to set things in order to establish them as New Testament churches and ordain native pastors then and train them up so they'll be able to watch over those flocks. And then they become an independent church. It doesn't make any difference what happens to everything else around them. You now have an independent, autonomous church in that location that will continue the process because they have been taught and, and, and trained up in this. And so it goes on and goes on and goes on. So the individual congregations are each under constant attack by our adversary, the devil. And there's no guarantee that any individual congregation will be faithful uh, and watching when the Lord returns. This is uh, as we think about the, the church history we're studying and everything. This is the lay of the sin age. And so there was no guarantee to any individual church. The church at Jerusalem, as far as a New Testament church, no longer exists. There are several churches there, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, perhaps others, you know, uh, that have, but the church that was originally organized there as a New Testament church is no longer there. I mean, it was when Jerusalem was destroyed and the uh, survivors scattered the church that was there passes out of existence other churches have come in later uh, the bishop of the church at Jerusalem was one of the five patriarchs of the Catholic Church of the old Catholic Church before it became the Roman Catholic Church um, and so on but there was one of the five patriarchs the same at Antioch uh, and so individual churches have passed. Either they've just passed out of existence or they have passed in that they have been, become so corrupted that they've been absorbed into that uh, universal church uh, that Satan has established. Um, but that promise was to his institution. And, and not to, so much to any individual church. This church 
we, there's that general promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. He said, if you keep in memory what I have said to you, if you, you know, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, you know, if you keep the order, it, there, you know, if you continue to be the pillar and ground of the truth and earnestly contend for the faith, then I'm with you as an individual congregation. Now, but we are responsible to maintain those scriptural principles and priorities as a church, the, the faith that was delivered, the ordinances that were delivered, and so on, and to perpetuate them, to earnestly contend for them and defend them and to keep them. And, and this is that, that Laodicean age, the last period uh, before the Lord returns. And so, Jesus, when he established his church before he left, he says, watch. Watch. We're to be constantly on guard. We're to be watch. We're to watch for the wolves and sheep's clothing. We're to watch for uh, these men rising up teaching perverse things. We're to watch, and we're to be watching for the Lord's return because our groom, our husband to whom we've been promised is returning. And we need to be ready for his return. We need to keep ourselves ready for his return. And, um, and so that is the responsibility then to, of each church to watch. Uh, so I say unto you that remain, watch, for Jesus will return at a time that people think not. At a time when people are going to be so busy and so focused on other things. And right now, you know, we're focused on COVID. We're focused on the political situation. And, and to some extent, we all are. This is part of our environment, our current events. These things are important to us. And we should be, at least to the extent that he says, you pray for those that are in authority. Pray for them. Intercede on their behalf. And so on and so forth. That we need to be doing. That, that is the concern of his people and his churches that are present under whatever government they might be under. We're to pray for those that are in authority. We're to pray for our enemies. We're to pray for those who despitefully use us. And so on. Uh, and that's part of our watching and, and being about the master's business. Uh, and so we're to do that because when he comes, there's a lot of people that are not going to be watching. They're not going to have their eyes on the Lord uh, when he comes back. But he closes his word to us in Revelation chapter 22. And verse 20 he says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Now, you say, well, that's been almost 2,000 years ago. That's not very quick. <laughs> and that's what Peter said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. You know, on God's timetable, it's only been two days. He's only been gone for two days. Um, He's not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness. And again, the idea is when he comes, it's going to happen quickly. Uh, and so we're to be ready. And John says, even so, come. Come. John's ready right then. Of course, he's on the Isle of Patmos. He's been persecuted and what have you. He's ready. He said, come. Now, and that, that should be our expectation, our desire. Lord, you said you won't come quickly. We're ready. Come. And uh, so, let us be watchful and be about the Lord's business. He has promised that He would have faithful churches. They may be battered and bruised and, and uh, showing the scars of the warfare that we have been engaged in over two, you know, 2,000 years, I started to say two centuries, but two millennia. 
his churches have been engaged in a desperate struggle against our adversary, the devil. And we are still holding on, but we're nowhere near what we were in the beginning. And uh, but we need to strengthen those things that remain. We need to watch, and we need to keep on serving the Lord. And so, perpetuity and succession. And again, these are terms we use, and, when, and especially when uh, studying from the Baptist perspective, uh, church history, and things. As we talked about before, the upper part of this chart represents, this is what the Catholic Church has taught concerning church history. This is what the Protestants believe concerning church history. And this is the worldview of church history. They, their idea of perpetuity and succession of the Catholic Church, you know, that's what we get accused sometimes because the Catholic Church... They talk about a succession, a succession of bishops, an Episcopal succession. Because they develop this pastoral authority that is passed on from one pastor to the other. You know, or a group of pastors through the ordaining and laying on of hands. That this authority is in the pastors and it's being passed down. Rather than the authority being in the church and being passed from church to church. Um... That's their succession. And sometimes we get accused, well, you're just like the Catholics in their uh, Episcopal succession. No, because theirs is a succession of ordinations. Ours is a succession of churches. Local, visible, autonomous congregations or assemblies uh, that have passed down in, in this way. And so to understand those terms, it's important, not just to use them and talk about perpetuity and succession, but to understand what it is, the, the concepts behind the terms and how this fits and the scriptures uh, that describes this uh, process and that there's a scriptural basis for it. And it goes back to the promise the Lord made. There in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not to Peter individually, but to his church. That's why he's talking about, I'll build my church. Peter's not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Peter was one of 12 apostles, and one of them was a traitor. He did not promise perpetuity to the apostles. Uh, and, and that's kind of what the, the Catholic Church, uh, especially emphasizing Peter, the, the apostolic succession. Um, but <laughs> there's a few problems even from their standpoint because, you know, in church history, I diverge a little bit here, but uh, they talk about the apostle, the apostles, and then it was the uh, next generation, the, the apostolic fathers, that was the next generation. Those were preachers that were saved and ordained under the, uh, uh, one of the apostles. And so you have like Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, and, and so on. And so they're kind of tracing this, you know, this apostle and then this one. Then you had the church fathers who were the next generation from the apostolic fathers. And there, that's that uh, apostolic succession, which is what the Catholic Church is, their thinking is founded upon, or they use that as an excuse for their existence. But uh, there was uh, one of the apostolic fathers who was a disciple of John, was the man that we mentioned this morning, Tertullian. He was part of that next generation, you see. And he split from the hierarchy. He split from the Catholic Church. They want to kind of, on one hand, claim him as one of the apostolic fathers and at the same time deny him 
because he believed that the baptism of heretics was not valid. He was an Anabaptist before they had coined the term Anabaptist. So, you know, but the authority, the perpetuation of the church was not in him, but in the church that, you know, John and different ones were members of and worked through that authority was in the church. Uh, we see that even the Apostle Paul, the church at Antioch sent him out. Him and Barnabas, they went back to the church at Antioch and rehearsed for them. Because they didn't have Facebook. They didn't have internet. They couldn't just instantly contact us. Hey, guess what, what happened today? They spent however long they were on that first missionary journey. Did what they did because they had the authority to do it. Then when they returned, they returned to the church that had authorized them and sent them out and rehearsed to them what all they had done under the authority of that church. And evidently did a good enough job they was willing to send him back out again later. But that was the, the process. So the authority was not in them as individuals, but in the church, the church that laid hands, ordained them and sent them out and to whom they were accountable and went back and gave an account. Anyway, I digress too much. Let us stand at this time, get our hymn books, hymn number 147. But the, the idea that we should understand what those terms mean, the scriptural foundation and basis for which we are using and applying those terms, uh, as one of the problems that a lot of times we talk about these things, People hear them, but they don't really have a foundation of understanding of them. And then when something else is presented to them that, and, and face it, Satan is a deceiver, he is cunning, and he presents things in such a way, it sounds good, it sounds right. And if people don't have that foundation, that understanding, they can be deceived. And so that's one of the reasons. Each generation needs to understand, not just uh, recognize the terms. Yeah, as Baptists, we talk about perpetuity and succession. Well, what does that mean? Where is the Scripture for that? And if there is Scripture for that, that which is contrary to that Scripture is false, and we ought to leave it alone. Anyway, hymn number 